Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. The transatlantic alliance system has weathered a number of storms during its 70-year history. We are told this is because of sustained American leadership. But can this same alliance system survive the storm named Trump? Cross-talking the transatlantic alliance system, I'm joined by my guest, Mark Sloboda. He's an international affairs and security analyst. We also have Dimitri Babich. He's a political analyst with Sputnik International. And we have Alex Christophora. He is the director and writer for the Duran.com. All right, gentlemen, cross-talk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Mark, let me go to you first here. Um, I'm the oldest on the program right here, and I have a good memory of the transatlantic uh, alliance system that's had its ups and downs, but this is turning into a sustained one. We're looking at security, we're looking at uh, international agreements, Iran comes into play, we're looking at energy, uh, and we're looking at, and Dima and I will talk about uh, uh, Italy a little bit later in the program, there is a swell, a grassroots swell of populism And welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. The transatlantic alliance system has weathered a number of storms during its 70-year history. We are told this is because of sustained American leadership. But can this same alliance system survive the storm named Trump? Cross-talking the transatlantic alliance system, I'm joined by my guest, Mark Sloboda. He's an international affairs and security analyst. We also have Dimitri Babich. He's a political analyst with Sputnik International. And we have Alex Christophora. He is the director and writer for the Duran.com. All right, gentlemen, cross-talk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Mark, let me go to you first here. Um, I'm the oldest on the program right here, and I have a good memory of the transatlantic uh, alliance system that's had its ups and downs, but this is turning into a sustained one. We're looking at security, we're looking at uh, international agreements, Iran comes into play, we're looking at energy, uh, and we're looking at, and Dima and I will talk about uh, uh, Italy a little bit later in the program, there is a swell, uh, grassroots swell of populism uh, protest, coming up in, 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 not, not in Europe. Protest, so, I mean, protest. there seems to be a cascade effect. There's a lot of elements in play right now, and I'm taking it seriously. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a, a serious incident, and, and certainly from if you went simply by the headlines in, in the press on both sides of the Atlantic talking about the doom of the West and the breaking up of the transatlantic alliance, Deutsche Welle saying, can, can the transatlantic alliance survive Trump? But... Unfortunately, we have all been here before. Uh, you know, during the eight long Bush years, books were being written comparing the U.S. to Mars and the EU to Venus and talking about their differences. And we had similar yeah, but, with Reagan, but they, with but there was, But there was a coalition, quote-unquote, of the uh, willing when it came to the invasion of, uh, of Iraq. I mean, they, there was... But... They did pull it off. But, but at the, the point is, time, will France they pull it off this Germany, time? Germany said no at the time, and actually sided with Putin. And we remember okay, that we're very well. Okay, we're going to go to the Russian angle on this here. Go ahead, Dima Jempel. Well, uh, I mean, it was Venus who first bombed Libya, for example. It was the French president who decided to bomb. You know, he had uh, some very reliable information. Sarkozy. Uh, uh, yes, uh, President Sarkozy. He had that uh, reliable information from uh, Bernard-Henri Lévy that, uh, you know, ultra-radical uh, a globalist uh, so-called philosopher who just went to Libya, talked to a few insurgents and said that we need to save these uh, Libyan Masouds, he said, referring to the Afghan warlord Ahmad Shah Masoud who fought the Soviet troops in 1980s. So basically uh, I think that uh, the amount of talk about a rift in the transatlantic uh, alliance, you know, there is a 
not such a big disagreement over Iran, but like any totalitarian structure, they are in panic well, about I mean, even no, a small I, I, disagreement. No, I think there is. I mean, let me go to Alex here because, I mean, the threat of sanctions against European companies here. I mean, not only is there a, mm -hmm. uh, a looming trade war, and we can talk about the, the specifics of that, but now, you know, basically going out and threatening the, uh, European companies here, and the Europeans have reacted with a blocking measure. I mean, this is different, gentlemen. This is very different than we've had in the past. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, this is very different because I think we're seeing the neoliberal honeymoon uh, is definitely over. And that was eight years with Obama, where you had Obama and Cameron and Merkel and, and all these people with this, this new rat pack of, of, of buddies that were, you know, running the world, you know, doing whatever they wanted to do. And, and you're seeing that come to a very decisive end with Trump. And, and Trump is very much, like it or not, Trump is keeping many of his campaign promises, um, especially in the foreign policy uh, area, and most notably moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and, of course, pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. So I, I think that you're starting to see Europe react right. to to what is essentially the neoliberal uh, um, community and the neoliberal policy come to an end, and that's that's due to the Trump effect. You know, Alex is staying with you. I I agree. He's keeping his campaign promises, and he doesn't care about the consequences. Mark, talk about that because you said uh, when we had when we're going back to the Iraq War, mm -hmm. there where, where uh, France and Germany were hesitant, mm -hmm. um, agreed with the Russians. Now we see agreement with Russia even more so. Is this a diplomatic opening for Russia? Yeah, uh, because uh, I mean, Merkel has gone to Sochi twice yeah, yeah, uh, recently. Yeah, just just like during the Bush years, Russia will of course. Uh, make take any opportunity to find room between Europe and, and, and the United States. That has always been its policy. It understands that its room for maneuver is, you know, f th th that it can make this crack widen is extremely limited. Well, um, I mean, we, we have the Iran, Iran deal, uh, Iran deal and, and we have energy, energy here, Europe, which is very, very important, important to the Germans and, and Europe in th general. This is the, the, the biggest news in the last week, is that uh, Trump is waging an economic trade war on the world at this point. Uh, they're, they're, they're launching a war of tariffs against China. They've launched tariffs ag uh, on, on steel and other things against South Korea, their, their, their ally in the Pacific. They've dropped out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, something that I actually agree with. Uh, but they've, uh, they've put new sanctions, uh, sanctions after sanctions after sanctions on Russia. Russia. Uh, they've renewed sanctions on Iran and promised to go further, North Korea, Syria. Now they're threatening sanctions in two ways against Europe. And the first way is over the Iran deal, right, uh, which uh, the EU is, is bringing up a, a 1996 blocking statute to, to vainly try to combat. And the other way is they're attempting to now dictate the EU's energy policy and energy security, saying if Germany completes the Nord Stream 2 pipeline with Russia, that it will, it will possibly enact sanctions, okay. the same sanctions okay. against Russia, against EU companies. Let's, let's, re yeah. let's, re let's remind our audience here the rationale, because Trump wants them to buy, the Europeans to buy American it's, energy. It's okay. mafia. I mean, it's, it's in a way, mafia. it's America first. It okay? does he, make a little bit of sense. He makes them an offer they cannot refuse, basically. <laughs> he, they can't refuse, but, right. But, uh, <laughs> look, I think it's another case of chicken coming home to roost. At this program, we discussed several times that this campaign against Trump after his election, and even before his election, it reminded us of the campaigns against the vilified dictators, so-called dictators in Ukraine, uh, you know, in Syria, in Iraq. Then it was used against Trump, against the American president. In the same way, the war of sanctions, which the United States has been waging against Russia, against other countries, now it is turning against Europe, you know. Something that the EU never expected to happen. Yeah. They thought it would be used against other people. Now it's used against them. So that, that, that's a very interesting moment. You know, Alex, Dima brings up a really good point because what has happened here is that the European Union has essentially left itself defenseless. It really has very few options because it, it never expected it would be this kind of breach that would face them. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and, and, and I think he's right because, let's face it, the EU pinned itself into, its, into, into a corner, into its own little box. And let's not also forget you have a lot of dynamics outside of Trump that are, that are leading to a lot of chaos within the EU and NATO. You have Turkey, which is, which is very iffy on its alliance with NATO and the West now. You have an EU which is very divided internally uh, from north to south and Eastern Europe to Western Europe. So you have a lot of dynamics which are causing a lot of chaos for the, for the leaders in Brussels. And Trump is, is going to play on that. And I think also Russia will play on that. 
Mark, that's a very interesting point because there is very little unity right now within the European Union. Uh, and Russia has always complained yeah. that it doesn't know who to speak to in the European Union because they're not unified. Yeah. Well, we have it in spades Space now. now. Yeah, I, I think the EU will wait Donald Trump out, be that two years, four years, eight years. I, I think we've seen this before. Okay. But I'm far more worried about the internal uh, uh, stresses within the European Union, the election of a of a joint far right, far left government in Italy, uh, noises of dissent in Hungary and Poland. Mark, and you, do you really think the Europeans can wait that long? It seems to me. It seems to me that the midterm elections in November in the United States will send an indication of what the European. They may wait a few months, but I don't think they can wait years. Well, okay? with this, this EU blocking statute is interest. It's a 1996 provision meant to be used to protect European companies from the U.S. blockade on Cuba. So what it's going to do is it's going to ban EU companies supposedly from recognize, from obeying the rule, although it's impossible to judge or enforce. And um, it, it uh, bans European courts um, from recognizing decisions against uh, companies because of these sanctions, and it will open up the European Investment Bank. But German officials have already admitted they can't uh, protect European companies. This is an outdated measure. They don't know how to update it. The Russian Duma is actually dealing with an, a nearly identical provision to forbid Russian companies from recognizing sanctions against Russia, and they're oh not having goodness. much luck with it either. But these are the European companies that already announced that they're pulling out of Iran. Total, the French energy giant. Maersk Tankers, the Danish shipping giant. Alliance, the German insurance company. Daniele, the Italian steel manufacturer. And China and Russia I'm, are jumping thank you to very step much, because that's exactly what China, I was going to say. Rushing exactly. to step in and swoop up Let me go to Dina here before we go to the break. There are plenty of players that will uh, fill the breach here. Mm -hmm. Okay, This is why sanctions are, are, is a, uh, sanctions are a blunt weapon yes. that will not achieve policy objectives. Go ahead. Uh, uh, basically, it's a boomerang. You know, these yeah. sanctions are a boomerang. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm, I agree with Mark that uh, this 1996 uh, measure is outdated precisely because the EU achieved its aim. Everything is now uh, digitalized. You cannot escape control. There is no more banking secret in the EU. The EU officials have recognized it about three, uh, three months ago that you cannot keep your information, your banking information secret. It's on the record in the United States and in the Peter, West globally. I'm, a, I'm afraid that EU sanctions are going to make a masochist out of me. I love them. <laughs> Sanction Russia some more. Sanction me some more, baby. Sanction the EU some more. Sanction South Korea. Tariffs well, against China. Let me go to, let me go to, to, more, let me go to Alex before we go to the break here. But this is really gets down to it's law, uh, it's law uh, affair. It's law affair. Now everyone is involved in law affair. The Americans perfected it. Now everyone's going to play the same game. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting to see that, you know, uh, practically speaking, if companies uh, do business with Iran, they may get punished by the U.S. If they don't do business with Iran, they're going to get punished by the EU. Of course, we're not going to see a lot of that happen. But uh, practically speaking, if you look at the blocking statute, that's pretty much what it says. So it's it's absolute chaos. OK, well, you know what, Alex, I'm going to go to the break here. But, you know, everyone gets penalized and then the Russians and the Chinese come in and fill the breach. They get paid. OK, again, the law of unintended consequences. Gentlemen, I'm going to jump in here. We're going to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on some real news. Stay with RT. OK, Mark, I want to go back to a story that is unfinished and I don't know if we'll ever be finished. The scripples in the UK. Who? Yeah, exactly, because it's dropped off I the pages here. Yeah. I mean, this is a story that will never end. Do you think we'll ever hear from the two principals uh, again? Um, I don't know. And one of the reasons is that according to members, uh, prominent members of the British press, they have been issued orders from the government not to report on certain details of the Scripples affair. What exactly those details are, where those details might lead. But would, would the British government, uh, their default position would be it, it is to defend national um, um, security interests? Is that, a, is that a viable defense? Well, I, I, mean, I mean, there, mean, it appears to be that they're using it. it, it, it uh, the, the argument that British national security is threatened if British media uh, questions the British government's own narrative about what happened and looks into details of this case does seem a, a, a little um, far-fetched to me. Okay. Well, it, it seems peculiar to me yeah. as well because um, it's, um, there's 
they're defending something that they that hasn't been explained. In another country, another country, they might call it blatant censorship. Okay, Dima, how do you look at this here? Well, because uh, it was the biggest story in the news, and now it's hardly there. Yeah. And there's been an enormous amount of damage done as well, a result. Well, look, if we compare it to the Litvinenko case, which started exactly 12 years ago, the Litvinenko case was much better staged. At least there were photos of him in the hospital. There were even interviews with him, even though controlled by some people around Perizovsky, by Lord Bell, who was their PR manager. Uh, but now we don't have the photos of the Skripals in the hospital. They were both discharged from the hospital, allegedly after touching this terrible nerve agent which just kills uh, all the uh, human beings around themselves in the, in the radius of one mile. They are somehow miraculously alive, but they don't give press conferences, they don't answer, quest uh, they don't answer questions, they don't meet the British press, that free British press, which somehow could not enter well, that hospital. Dima, I mean, the, the score of script, let's make sure, uh, supposedly Novichok, yes. the, the score is Novichok zero, humans three, Absolutely. Right? because even though supposedly there is no cure, according to Britain's own leading well, scientists. Well, don't forget about those ga guinea pigs and uh, cat. Okay? Two guinea okay. pigs and a cat. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me let Alex jump in here. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and let's not forget that the most disturbing part of all of this is that you had a Russian citizen um, denied access to speak with, with the Russian embassy. So, I mean, you see a blatant disregard for international law, a blatant disregard for, for diplomacy and international diplomacy. You had Russian citizens who, who, were, who were in trouble in a foreign country, and the UK government denied the embassy access to Yulia Skripal. And now you're going to have two people essentially disappear. I mean, no one's going to know where they're going to be taken to, where they're going to go. They're just going to be vanished off, okay. off the face of That's what face we of don't Earth. know. We don't know well, whether Yulia Skripal okay. wants to talk to okay. her family and, and, and that's for the, the Russian point. government. And, and, I think, and, and, and to be fair here, I think it is incumbent upon the British government to be a little bit more transparent about their decision-making well, process because this is a, a huge story of public interest. They were uh, uh, implications of the alleged poisoning and the alleged perpetrator. There have been political facts created on the ground, and I think it's, that's why we need to know more, and we need more transparency. Go well, ahead. I mean, uh, they also promised to give Yulia a new identity, so it's not but just... It, does she want one? Do we know that? We don't know. No one interviewed her. This is the problem, you there, know. There has been a statement Can you issued mean? by the British police, supposedly on her behalf, obviously not using her own... Uh, words in command of the English without language. Without her singage, signature, without anything. anything. So yeah. imagine you, uh, me as a Russian citizen, coming to the UK, and then someone very wise takes me, tells everyone, oh, this guy was poisoned by RT propaganda. He needs treatment, he needs a new identity, uh, the Russian embassy can't talk to him. So that's, uh, you know, there is a precedent for a similar thing happening. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, let's if, change. If the roles were reversed, the, the, the international community, the Western democracy, would, would be outraged. If the there, there, there would be hashtags free Yulia Skripal. Okay, well, well, <laughs> we want to see you Skripal. Remember Pussy Riot? You remember Pussy Riot? We want to see you there, Skripal. All right, gentlemen, let's, let's, let's change gears here. I mean, I, I wanted to do this story earlier, but it's still going on here. Um, the, the massacres are going on in. Uh, in, in Gaza. Um, we don't, we had a re UN resolution at the Security Council that was vetoed by the United States to look into an investigation in what happened there. One of the reasons why I'm bringing up the story is because I think, that, again, Western media um, uh, shamelessly um, did not cover the story with it, the, the, the accuracy and maybe morality that it was needed, basically saying, it was a, um, a, a, a conflict of equal measure, okay? Mm. No, one side had snipers and one other side had no guns, yeah. had banners and flags. We have and a stoles, massacre maybe. here, not, and not there's, there's this moral equivalence. Yeah. There is no immoral but, equivalence there, Mark. Yeah, the, the, the Western media, and this is how propaganda is done, universally, almost universally, discussed this uh, massacre, and then it was a massacre. When you have 60 some people killed on one side and 2,400 possibly, I've seen that number of injured, injured on one side and zero dead, zero injured on the other, that is not clashes. That is a massacre. And um, we continually had the use of the passive sense. Palestinians died. People died in clashes. No, they were killed. 
the Israeli regime, the Zionist regime in control of Israel and much of Palestine killed 60 people uh, and, and open fire, killing medics, women, children. You know, Mark, on I have a sense that um, on uh, English language international television, you're one of the few people, uh, individuals that have ever said anything of that magnitude about this massacre. This proves my point, okay? Because we still have St uh, Stormy Daniels and we have uh, Trump calling uh, um, uh, 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 drug uh, gangs from Sal El Salvador animals. That gets the headlines, not a massacre of well, innocent people. I mean, I can give you already several examples when the death of dozens of people illegal death of dozens of people did not matter to the, uh, to, to, to the Western press. Donbass. 33 Odessa. policemen <laughs> killed in Kiev during the so-called peaceful protests against Yanukovych. 32 policemen killed. No, uh, not a single word about them, you know, in, in the British or in the American press after uh, Pre President Yanukovych was ousted. They said that he fled in the middle of the night after having 30, 32 policemen killed. Yes, he I'd fled. Flee too. Right? Mm -hmm. I would flee also, so, sorry. Uh, then 60 uh, uh, Syrian soldiers killed by American aviation uh, uh, by mistake near Deir ez -Zor. Mm -hmm. And there was this an was apology, a yes, a year ago, an apology uh, which, uh, you know, however, was con uh, kind of continued by American interference in, in Syria. Then now we have 60-something Palestinians killed. And again, this is not so important as, uh, you know, uh, the, the opening of the new embassy in Jerusalem, that up there yet. Which, which was happening at that very moment, or maybe the marriage, the royal marriage in the UK. These are more important events than the illegal death of uh, 660 people. You know, Alex, I'm, gl I'm glad that Dima brought that up. I mean, we have basically, in, uh, in real time, we have the opening of the American embassy in Jerusalem against international law and UN resolutions. And and we, um, you have basically a split screen, okay? Clashes, that are not clashes, it's a massacre. And then we have this uh, uh, opening of the American embassy with all smiles and all of that here. Um, what kind of message is that sent? Because it seems to me the Western media is sending a message of impunity. You can break international law and, and not be called on it because if we look at, look at the, the legal writing at the United Nations under Security Council resolutions, we're not making it up here. These are facts, okay? And then whitewashing a massacre in, Ga in Gaza. What does that say about um, uh, Western media and maybe Western policy in general? It, impunity and hypocrisy. Um, Dima mentioned it, and, and I'll go even further. You know, when you had staged uh, chemical attacks in Syria, the United States was about to go to war. And here you had 60 people uh, killed via sniper fire. I mean, let that sink in. This is not, um, you know, indiscriminate rifle fire just being sprayed everywhere. These are soldiers who are sitting, you know, in a position and they're and, and they're picking yes. off people and they're picking off uh, not journalists and they're picking off kids. Doctors, and off doctors. Women, not doctors. just doctors. Medics on the yes. ground have reported not only are they snipers, they were using butterfly bullets that are designed to fragment inside the body to do as much internal damage as possible. This is not a wartime environment. This is not a war. This is, this is a, a, a civilians are, are, are being targeted here, not military. And two-thirds of the people... Sure go ahead, do, do, go ahead. Alex, jump in in Cyprus. Real, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Real, real quickly, if I could just say, the, the, the media quickly blamed it all on Hamas, saying, oh, well, why did Hamas bring children into this protest? Why did they push children towards the Israeli borders? I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely sickening to think about it, that they're, that they're pitting the blame on all of this on Hamas bringing children into, into the line of fire. If you, if you vote for a political party, if you're a member of a political party that the Western governments, I don't like Hamas myself, right, any more than I like the Zionist regime in control of Israel. But if you belong to a political party that was elected democratically that they don't like, they have the right to massacre you. Did you know that? <laughs> that that's the twisted well, logic no, here. Also, ahead, let, let's not forget that Hamas is just the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, which the United States supported in Egypt in Syria, in a lot of other places, the, the United States almost legitimized the Muslim Brotherhood. So when, when the well, Muslim... So, so did Israel by trying to break up Fatah. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have an alternative to it, and this is what they got. Mm -hmm. So again, Israel, if you, every single foreign policy initiative they've taken, almost since, since their existence, backfires on them, okay? Hamas is the latest one. Oh, we Absolutely. could talk about Hezbollah as well. It yeah. wasn't there before the invasion, the illegal invasion mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of Lebanon. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, 
again the law of unintended consequences. And, and please look, you know, when the Muslim Brotherhood went against the Syrian government uh, uh, of Mr. Assad in 2011, they were legitimized by the Western press, you know, they were the just democracy fighters. When they went against the government of Israel, then you can kill 60 people and they won't even blink, you know. Uh, so it's, it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy at its peak, I would say. You know, but the interesting thing is we're going to have to end on this note here, and I'm going to take a, a, a tear a page from Alex Christofori that we have in Cyprus here. Um, you can disagree with all the things that Donald Trump is doing, but he's keeping his word to his base and his campaign. I've never seen a president in my lifetime keep his word on things that I'm very much against. Something. At least he's consistent. That's all the time we have, gentlemen. Many thanks to my guests here in Moscow and in Cyprus. This is the end of our broadcast segment. Stay with us for the extended version on our YouTube channel. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules.